John, how'd you get started? In comedy? Uh, well, the first thing I did uh, professionally was I worked for Image Central in California. Uh, I was a, a production assistant out there under Jim Valentino. Uh, Jim Valentino was a really great boss. I uh, really appreciate him. Got a lot of love for that guy. And uh, he was very kind to me while I was there. Uh, while I was out there, I ended up, uh, you know, meeting Rob Liefeld. And uh, I've always been a huge Rob Liefeld fan. Even before I went out to Image Central, I, I was on like Rob's boards. I don't, I don't know if it's Miller World at that time, but... Uh, you know, the, the Rob had message boards and, you know, I'd be over there, you know, hey, Rob. anyway, so, uh, you know, became a, eventually became an assistant for Rob. Uh, I would do light boxing and the sort uh, for him. And uh, I got my first full comic published through Rob, which was called Nitrogen. Nice. And uh, it's uh, it, there's two issues of it out there. That's, you know, crude, you know, John Malin artwork, you know, for the time, a lot of pinheads and wacky stuff going on there. But uh, someone had it the other day, and I was, you know, was holding up on stream. A lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of nice design and stuff like that, just you know, coming onto the page. So you know, it wasn't, it wasn't finessed or whatnot, but uh, you know, not bad. Yeah. Um, you know, I ended up getting a, a job at Marvel for a very quick stint. It was a, a fill-in for Cable, Deadpool. Uh, this is, you know, handful of years later, um, and then that went to a, a two-issue deal for Kevin Grievous when he was writing New Warriors. Uh, and then I went, you know, uh, you know, comic wise, uh, let's see the, uh, I was, I was getting a, a project together with a guy named Mark Poulton, a writer, uh, called graveyard shift. And then while I was working on graveyard shift, uh, you know, I'm sending those pages out to like Marvel and whatnot. And, uh, uh, Rob got a hold of him at some point, And then he wanted me on for a run for young blood over at image. So the, you know, good stuff. That's where I kind of really started fine tuning my art. That's where I started crossing over into digital uh, full time. So like if you bought the first couple of issues of that run, it's, it's all darkened pencil. Uh, and then I would do digital cleanup. And, and then eventually I, I just came to the mindset. I was like, well, if I, it, because I'm doing so many changes in post, if I just start drawing this into the computer, which I was very comfortable with at that time, then I'd save myself some time. I'm fascinated by this. How long have you been doing your art digitally? Uh, well, I think the Young Blood run was around 2012. Wow! So you're like you're you're a true pioneer in it then. So, anyways, I did the Young Blood, and uh, then I went back to working on Graveyard Shift pages. Uh, eventually, I got hired in by Tom Brevoort uh, to do Thunderbolts. Uh, Thunderbolts led into Cable, and then after Cable, uh, then I came over and started doing work with Richard doing Jawbreakers. But there, there's a whole story at my time at Marvel, uh, which is, you know, I was getting, you know, what I'd call, a, you, know, politi you know, politically driven editorial in interference. I, I was, you know, being accused of not being able to do a ha girl's hair a certain way because it looked like dreads, and that would be cultural appropriation. Uh, you know, the, I was getting told hips were being cocked too much. It was too sexified, I guess. Uh, you know, so and apparently even though this was coming through my at the time editor, Alana Smith, uh, I, I learned later on that some of these were actually just forwarded from Tom Brevoort, uh, according to Tom. So, um, yeah, so it, 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 it was making my time at Marvel, which I thought was going to be a nice, enjoyable deal, you know, because uh, all the time in between all those jobs, you know, I'm working blue collar. You know, yeah. I'm out, I, I, you know, I, I literally built bridges for years, highway bridges and you know, overpasses. So, um, so when I got there, I, I, I just, I didn't even really kind of understand what was going on. I was kind of learning about it as I went about, you know, cultural appropriation. I was like, huh, 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 what? Huh, huh. So, uh, by the time I was over on cable, actually the attitude was better. I believe my editor was, uh, my overseeing editor was Mark. Panic, Panacea, Panacea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, uh, and, and that seemed to go really well. Uh, he had a junior editor, I, I, uh, the, the guy that I was directly talking to. I can't remember his name, though, offhand. Sorry about that to whoever that editor was. But things seemed to go much better, much smoother over there. I mean, I was able to draw boobs. Nobody was giving me any crazy <laughs> notes about this stuff. Uh, that was until Bleeding Cool apparently caught wind of one of my covers where uh, – Blink had some uh, enlarged breasts, and the, the funny thing about the Bleeding Cool article was that they even said if Malin's trying to stand out on the stands, well, he did it. 
And it's like, well, yeah, I am trying to stand out in the stands. I'm trying to sell my book. Like I'm trying, I want my book to sell more copies than anybody else's book. Yeah. Well, why should I water down any, any opportunity that I have uh, to make money for this company to make somebody else feel good about, it? <laughs> you know, uh, oh man, those, those boobs. So anyways, after that happened, uh, there was an editorial change. Uh, I, another guy came in, uh, I think his name's Darren Shan. Uh, I, I believe that's who it was. Uh, and then it became an issue. All, all this previously approved artwork that I had done had become an issue. So uh, he he uh, said he was going to go through and have uh, all my art, uh, my boobs shrunken down. Everything was going to be everything was going to be corrected. So he did that with the Blink character and then this Asian girl character that were that were in there as well. Um, so I said I did not want that to happen. If that happened, I said I'm I'm going to uh, finish my agreement, which was to do five issues of Cable. And I said, and then I'm going to be done with cable. I don't really have much interest in going forward this time because I, I just had enough of these stupid fucking idiot comments on my art. I'm only here to sell books. Like, I'm trying to sell books. And if you look at what they're doing in the manga market, everything I've ever done is tame by comparison to what's going sure, on in, yeah, the, market, of course, in yeah. the manga market. And the manga market is incredibly huge. And that's where we should be reaching. You know, that's where Absolutely. the mainstream should be reaching for. And I'm not saying we should be moving into anything close to, like, uh, pornography or anything like that. But if you can draw a chick and you can make her look sexy, well, guess what? Manga's been doing it nonstop for decades now. You know, they're right. they're king. Manga's king. So, you know, if Marvel and DC, if they are, well, let me say Marvel, if they're satisfied being in this low rank, number one in America as an American publishing publisher, but, you know, dead last in terms of the true mainstream of comics, uh, that's fine. Stay at the bottom and then look where we are now. Everybody's, you know, starving. All the pros out there, the freelancers aren't getting paid shit. So. Uh, and, and more and more, uh, the, this market is just being whittled down bit by bit, you know, by morons, complete fucking morons. They don't care about making money for the company. They're, they're ideologically driven. So, and then uh, while I was uh, working for Tom, you know, and, and this was an important point too, when Alana Smith was my editor, she put that uh, tweet out that said, uh, if you voted for Trump, uh, win or lose, we're going to, we're going to remember, you know, like yeah. we're going to. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that was a, you know, we're going to remember. Yeah, we know who you are. Yep. I remember yeah, that. So, I remember that and I, I was directly under her and I was just like, this is, this is fucking bullshit. You know? And I was even like a hundred percent on board for voting for Trump at the moment. But as soon as that came out, cause I have plenty of friends and family that, you know, are going to vote that way. And I'm just like, ah, oh, you fucking bitch. So she, you know, thank you, Alana. She radicalized me and here I am. But, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's just the ridiculousness of what I was seeing at the time, you know, cause you can look at the editorial tweets, you know, whatever that was, 16 to 18, uh, you know, 2016 to 18. You can look at editorial tweets and they're all getting, uh, they're all activists. Like uh, yeah. there was there was another lady that was going, another editor, a female editor that was going out to, I think it was New York Comic Con and she had posted, oh yeah, come over here, show your, show your portfolio. But if you're a guy, you know, Maybe don't put again. I'm paraphrasing. Maybe don't put so much effort into it because we got so many of y'all. And it's like, wow. wait, what? You wow. know what I mean? Like, yeah. we're here for the we're here for the town. This is a again. We're, we're this is a business. We're here to make money for people. Um, but this, you know, yeah. and then obviously there was a lot of anti-white uh, bullshit going on through editorial tweets as well. Uh, you know, I mean, just everybody. A lot of people in editorial at Marvel were radicalized. I can't speak for what was going on at DC at the time, but I can speak for Marvel at the time. Uh, people are getting radicalized. Tom Brevoort, I think, went public and told his own son to fuck off or something along the lines what? of that because he was voting. His son was yeah, voting Trump. for Trump. He told us. Yeah. So I mean, it it was it was this isn't something that is in people's head that there is some kind of discrimination going around. I mean, it was, it was obviously there. You would have to be blind to ignore this stuff. And if it and again, if 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 it, the pendulum was the other way around, and if it was all conservatives in Marvel and they were laying out the same same ideas in the same amount of aggressiveness that the left was doing, it would be an uproar. You know, it, it would be, it would be a comic skate would be the other way around. It, it was just, it, it was almost like a, not a nightmare scenario, but it, it was very disgusting what was happening. And a lot of people just turning blind eyes to it, you know, or, you know, just happy to, to watch it from the sidelines. So these are the two uh, individuals in question uh, mm. that John is talking about by way of illustration. 
<laughs> as you can see, uh, Alana Smith has become kind of a ventriloquist dummy sitting on Tom Brevoort's lap. She's adopted uh, his look. She's <laughs> like, I'm the son that you always wanted. I thought that uh, was a mm. picture of him and his son at first. <laughs> When you were talking about, he told his son to go fuck off, and here's a picture of his him and his son. But apparently not. That's it. That's him and his mini me. It's almost that's like, yeah. the son he wanted. Yeah. It, it, what, what What's interesting about the the few photos that I've seen is like when Alana Smith had just gotten into Marvel, she re looked relatively you know normal, and as time went on, she started going more and more in this direction, and it was just like you know you just watch you know I don't I don't know you know I don't know what it is the the. Uh, just the corruption, you know what I mean, going yeah. on, and and I'm not sure who is corrupting who first, but uh, they're they're definitely both corrupt people, in my I, opinion. I, and I and, and let me is. say that the sad thing about Tom Brevoort actually is that you know, like he he was one of like he was an actual nerd, you know, like oh, you know, he used to be the guy that that if you needed to know an issue of something, mm -hmm. he he was that brainy guy, and he could tell you, well, this happened in Fantastic Four, yeah. you know, it, you know, like he that like he had he served a real purpose in the. Uh, whatever the 90s uh mm -hmm. maybe the early 2010s you know but but the thing is is like now all that history all that stuff it doesn't really matter because there's so many reboots and whatnot so i mean like his purpose at marvel has really been like diminished so mm -hmm. you know you think he, he would take make push up for that with better editorial skills and, and you know learning how to you know motivate people into creating sales instead of uh creating uh separation uh division but uh he chose, you know, division separation over, you know, making money for the company, I believe. So then you, so you basically here you are, you, you're breaking your ass, you're mm -hmm. doing your, your day job, right? Your blue collar mm -hmm. work. You finally, I don't know how you make your way out. Did you make your way out to California? That's how you got started working for Image with Jim Valentino. Mm -hmm. Did you actually get on a plane with your savings? Yep. Go to oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, when how I got into Image Central, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to go into all the details. That's why I was trying to move through. But how I got into Image Central was, you know, I was in Michigan. Literally, I mean, there was a imagecomics.com, you know, website. Uh, I don't know. If they, I guess they probably still have that. Uh, but there was a little banner ad and just said, hey, we're looking for, you know, interns, you know. And I was like, ooh, intern. You know, I was like, hey, that might be an opportunity for me to get a foot in the door. Uh, so I answered the ad and I got in contact with them that they, they, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, I'm in Michigan. They're like, oh, well, we don't really want anyone from out of state. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. I was like, don't count me out. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I literally I, I hopped on a uh, on a plane immediately and uh, flew out there, uh, you know, sat in for the interview and uh, got hired in. And it was a three month unpaid internship, which would eventually oh. le lead into a, a paid job if I did well. Uh, you know, and I was only supposed to show up, I think maybe two to two to three days a week, I think was the, in, the initial plan. But, uh, you know, I was driven and, uh, you know, I, I, I was there five days a week, every day, all day, uh, trying to make myself as useful as possible because I, there was no way uh, that I could possibly let this go. And, you know, but I, but I was married at the time. So my wife stayed in Michigan for three months. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, so. You know, she, you know, she and family were footing the bill largely just so I could get this one thing to really happen. Uh, you know, so, you know, even to this day, it's like, you know, if it wasn't for my wife, it wasn't for my family, you know, I, I wouldn't even got that, that one foot in the door. So for three months, it, it was a struggle. It was me riding a bus <laughs> every day, um, you know, so, uh, and sometimes walking, you know, I, I, I walked home from uh, Image, which is uh, about eight, I, it was in located in Orange and I was living in Bray at the time. So I don't know what that is, a six, eight mile deal. So <laughs> whatever it took, whatever it took is, uh, was my attitude while I was out there. It just, it had to happen. I had to, I had to get a start going. And that was around 2000 two maybe 2003 so it just it you know that you know so to kind of finish that up uh and get us back to all the miller stuff whatever so after i had left uh cable uh someone had asked me a question about the x-men and if they you know about them being sjw's like aren't the x-men sjw's that, that tweet that, right so that guy tweeted yeah and that, i remember that that's and, yeah. and, and this is like my infamous moment apparently i didn't think it was too outlandish what i was saying but i said well actually uh x-men are more like the jews and uh sjw hitler's germany where 
They see ideologues rising, uh, to, you know, again, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, separating people uh, based on race and, you know, uh, you know, the, the segregating the population like they did to the Jews. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it like I didn't paint it in a good light for SJWs. I said basically, uh, you know, that the uh, I, I said that I tried to put this out very carefully. I said the SJWs are not Nazis, but the Nazis were SJWs. So, uh, anyways, and that went off like a firestorm. Like I, I thought it was a, I thought it would be a, a, a small little bump, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, I knew there was a bit of language in there that was going to fire people up. But it, it, what it really turned into, and Ethan kind of reminded me of this the other day because he was reposting this tweet, uh, was that people read that somehow, somehow they read that as me saying that the X Men were. Nazis, I think. It's, it's oh, like, I, how are you pulling that out? So, anyways, but that that was the fuel that that everybody went. I mean, I had people from uh, some lady from Deep Space Nine trying to cancel me. Oh, I, I, still, I, I still think of the, of the opportunity one day to just show up when she's signing and say, "Hey, do you know me?" No, I don't. Oh, okay, because you, you tried to you tried to get me fired. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> isn't that nice? You know. You so. just yeah. John used to be in the diversity and comics chats. That's where I, I got to see him. And I felt like I was the only pro that was watching Richard C. Meyer and diversity and comics. Uh, and then here's John with his uh, McFarlane-esque Spider-Man avatar uh, that I think he drew. Was That that was your mm -hmm. Spider-Man, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he would show up there and he would just participate. And uh, people would, a lot of fans discovered John. A lot of people discovered John from being in the chat back then. And I did too. Um, uh, but uh, be a DC guy back then. Now, did you? Yeah, know I, I didn't before mm -hmm. then. No, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was paying zero attention to what Marvel was doing, yeah. even less what Rob Liefeld was doing. I, you know, I was very, <laughs> uh, very busy doing my own stuff. But uh, I, I like John quite a bit, and I, I will, rem I do remember vividly the moment uh, when uh, I'm in bed and my phone starts going off. I start getting all these texts from people. And uh, this was January 28th, uh, 2018. Hmm. And uh, I'm like, what's going on here? And I've got all these texts from like comic skaters saying, you got to help John Malin. He's being canceled right now. You got to get out of bed and help him. I'm like, what do you mean he's being canceled? What happened? Uh, and I saw what he had tweeted. And uh, I was like, oh, huh, well, that's a, that's a firestorm waiting to happen. That's pretty incendiary. Uh, and uh, Richard C. Meyer also uh, uh, texted me and said, what can you do? You want to do something for John? So I got up and it was like 11 p.m. And uh, I, I asked John if he wanted to come on and clarify his comments, thinking that he would walk it back a little bit. Because I was still in this thing like we got to mollify these people, see what we can do about mending bridges. And this is when John really got his reputation with fandom this moment, mm -hmm. because I said, you want to clarify? You want to rewrite your tweet? And John said, yeah, let me say it again, but like louder. Uh, and he <laughs> like he doubled down on his comments. He he was not, he did not back down. Uh, he said, I meant what I said, uh, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm not walking any of it back. You can go back and listen to it. It's fascinating. I remember He's, that. I remember it's, that. It's terrible. <laughs> it is, at the time, I, I was barely, I mean, it just... It was a terrible interview. I cannot go back and listen to it. But I haven't. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, ashamed but, but, of but, myself but, in it. It's but the, just, the, you were the great. Point, the point being, there, the, you know, there's nothing to walk back. It, you know, saying that stuff, I still believe it to this day. I, I don't think anything I said was wrong or inaccurate. So I, I think that uh, what the SJWs were doing then and now to this day, I think it's dangerous. I think it's very dangerous. Why? Yeah. What are they doing, and why is it dangerous? <laughs> Uh, well, they're infiltrating industry. They're uh, they're they're rapidly trying to, and uh, in some cases successfully successfully trying to change culture, uh, the narrative, the de definition of words. Uh, you know, they're vilifying in this case white people, uh, straight white men. Uh, you know, I mean, they're 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 trying to make them you know the the uh, scapegoat for all society's ills, just like the Nazis did to the Jews. So, uh, and then as that keeps creeping along, you, you know, who knows, you know, you think that your tweet was deliberately misunderstood and misrepresented. Oh, sure. Or do you think they just didn't understand? <laughs> no, I, no, I, I think, I, I think a lot of those people that reacted to it were just activists. It didn't matter that there, there was somebody that they could, you know, just try and, you know, you know, cancel. 
Like, here's an opportunity to try to destroy a human being, even though what he said is perfectly reasonable to 99% of the people at the time. Uh, but all the fringe is going to come out and make it sound like it's, you know, this crazy thing. But also, I mean, at the time, uh, Bellini Cool, you know, did a story on that. And, you know, and, and that's what really pissed me off at the time was Rich Johnston wrote an article on me um, and tried to connect me to a white nationalist website. Uh, oh, because when I because when I worked for Marvel and I did Thunderbolts, I, I did a uh, billboard in in the background of one of the like this flashback scene. Marvel had this storyline. I, I can't remember what it was called, like Pleasant Hill or Pleasantville or something like that, um, which was basically all these supervillains are living in this town, but they all get different identities. They don't know that who they were, and uh, you know. So I, I was like, well, this is very much like Dark City, a movie from the '90s. So I. I put in a billboard shell beach, which is a, a plot point in mm -hmm. dark city. Right. Uh, you know, and that, and that was all I ever cared about. But anyways, uh, you know, go three years later, two years later when, you know, uh, now I've put this tweet out. Now what that was, was a white nationalist dog whistle, uh, according to bleeding cool. So they, 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 they said, because I was, referencing dark city, which, uh, people, I guess, lump in with the matrix. They, th this white national site was, was putting like the red pill and the blue pill. And that became a white nationalist thing at the time. Uh, and then they, they also mentioned somewhere in that article, <laughs> something about dark city. So anyways, these were two movies that you could not enjoy. Apparently, uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you lean conservative or, you know, whatever, uh, and, uh, you know, not be vilified for it. Yeah, Imagine to, 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 to say that you like uh, the Matrix, you know, if you, you happen to not be a leftist, can you imagine that? Now you're a Nazi. Now, did they uh, did they reach out to you? Was it Rich Johnson or someone to reach out and say, hey, we're kind of getting this vibe, but someone alerted us to this. Yeah, alerted us. Look at this. Um, and was this what you mean by posting this thing about Dark City or they just run with it? No, no. They, uh, Rich Johnson was aggressive, and I, I, I was actually tweeting at him at the time. I think they did an article of that, but uh, you know, basically, I was telling, you know, telling him, you know, he was a, you know, uh, I think, I, I think I said, "You suck," <laughs> you know. I was just it, it, the whole thing was ridiculous. And then I believe it was that same article, that same narrative was carried over onto like CBR or something like Comic Book Resources. So. Uh, you know, at least in my sphere, you know, you know, but I understood CBR and, and Newsarama, Bleeding Cool to kind of be like the big three of, you know, comic book uh, news. So um, anyways, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I was just like, wait, don't don't you guys want to <laughs> go into this? No, they, they really didn't care. They didn't care at all. Again, I, I, I think that Rich Johnson, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people that are already into the mainstream comic book media uh, were already activists. So it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Uh, all that mattered was here's here's a here's an early chance for us to try to take somebody out. So let's do it. Well, the, the good news is, I guess that now I guess that you were covered in CBR. I'm sure that they were more than happy to to have a, a, a headline article with you after you passed your, you know, a million dollars on crowdfunding. Right. With yourself. No. Comic, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No, no, no one's ever uh, mentioned oh, no, none of that. None of that. None, none of that. Yeah. So they, they don't, they, yeah, they don't, and... they don't want to know that people are becoming successful without their help. You know, if, if you can become successful without CBR, Newsarama, Bleeding Cool, uh, then that really kind of makes them feel inadequate. So they're not going to, they're not going to go out there and promote uh, independent creators out here actually becoming successful. Yeah. So, so far I've raised like $1.3 million on my campaigns. Uh, and that's not even counting the jawbreakers, which went right. to, I, I think it went, it raised like $400,000, something like that. So, yeah, so you're closing in on your projects or closing in or yeah, closing in on $2 million for independent mm -hmm. self-published creator owned projects mm -hmm. yep. without the help of right. Not getting any mainstream press. Uh, I mean, let me tell you something, John, if you're riding your bicycle and you hit some kid, and, you know, with it, and you, you kill some kid or you run over a puppy, you're going to be splashed front page on the, that kind of news. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything, to bring, anything to bring me down. Yeah. They'll make, make right. an article on that. Sure. Yeah, uh, let's just hope I don't do that. <laughs> no, don't do that. Well, shit. Now everyone knows why you're so pissed off all the time. 
Yeah. He, is, he has every right to be pissed off. Yeah. Let me let me take you on a tour, Billy, because you weren't here. And then, John, you're going to hate this. Uh, but uh, I got to do this so that people understand uh, where you're coming from. Remember this guy here? Uh, Gabe is one of my favorite culture writers and making a comparison between Jawbreakers and the many, many failed projects that popped out of Gamergate is a good reason why. So he's this guy is sharing the media efforts of this writer right here who took it upon herself uh, to cancel John Malin and Richard C. Meyer. Do you understand how this works? You've got SJW activists in the mainstream who are friends with people in the media, uh, and together they work to get a narrative out there that destroys people like John Malin and myself. Here's Gavia Baker Whitelaw. An indie comic is following the Gamergate pl uh, playbook by monetizing alt-right nerds to the tune of just $250,000, John. This was early mm -hmm. on in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see right here. So there's a whole article here talking about the strategy. If you've seen people tweeting about Comicsgate and a crowdfunded comic being dropped by its publisher, this is what's going on. Uh, and uh, she wrote uh, this article here, indie comic Jawbreakers uh, canceled due to Comicsgate links. Uh, so yeah. uh, this is the person who's being... So so John, talk about this a little where bit. Was, like, Where was this? Where was this, this uh, published? Or stream? Where was it? What, what website is this? I'm not sure what website it's okay. on. Parsec, okay. it's called. I don't know. I think it's called Parsec here. Okay, how original. Yeah, yeah. so the whole Jawbreakers project came about after I did that tweet. Uh, you know, uh, actually, I, I believe uh, early on people in, uh, were, were pointing Richard out to me because I was working on cable. And so it was in my style. I guess he was a Liefeld fan. Uh, so, you know, like, oh, you should go check out this guy. And then after the uh, cancellation happened, uh, Richard gave me a call, uh, and asked if I would work on Jawbreakers. So it was a book that he was writing and yeah, I was already aware of Richard. I was already aware of what was going on. And, uh, you know, so, you know, at the moment at, at that time, I, I told him, I, I'm like, well, give me, you know, give me a little time. I'm going to think about it. Cause I, I felt like in terms of comics, this was kind of like the, a, a big move. I was like, and Richard had said, he's like, uh, you know, I'm controversial, you're controversial, you know, together we can, you know, maybe do something. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I took a couple of days and thought about it. And then I was like, all right, let's do it. So uh, we, uh, you know, started working together on Jawbreakers, made that happen, put it out on crowdfund. I think we ran our, I don't know if we ran the entire campaign before the real action kicked in exactly. But Richard at some point had lined up a deal with Antarctic Press to uh, publish Jawbreakers. So we were, okay. we were we were doing the crowdfund and we were going to go into comic shops and we we're going to do everything the way that you're supposed to make comics, especially if no publisher, you know, or people out there don't want anything to do with you. Well, right. you have also, to do it on your own. Not so you're... To the, and not a cost to the publisher because yeah. the book will be mm -hmm. done, right, by the time mm -hmm. it gets yep. to them. Okay, yeah. Yep, yeah, it would have been easy money for Antarctic Press to publish right. this book. Uh, you know, they wouldn't have to worry about whether or not we're going to have the money to do it or not. Uh, so anyway, so uh, my understanding was the deal was pretty much laid out. And then uh, right around the time that our campaign was ending, I think that's when they really kind of came in. Uh, Mark Wade uh, gave a call to the uh, main guy at Antarctic Press or, or tweeted something about the hounds of, you know, he's stopped. He's the only thing between that guy and like the hounds of hell coming in to uh, uh, basically ruin Antarctic Press if they publish Jawbreakers. And uh, I guess it, whatever my, Mark Wade, the uh, writer of Kingdom Come and, you know, Big Shot over Marvel and DC, uh, whatever uh, he said to the, uh, the publisher, I, I believe it actually made him get emotional, uh, like, uh, you know, teary eyed. Because uh, he thought his entire business that he's he's operated for X amount of years was about to come crumbling down because of this one move. So uh, you know, he told Richard, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, we're not going to be able to publish you anymore. And uh, you know, so that that left and us they, kind of in a lurch. Now, and I, I wanted to bring this up too because you know, like I said, this is now we're going on six years now ago. So a lot of people, you know, you know, CG has grown so much that I'm sure there are people out there that are not fully aware of this right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that drove me nuts was I, I believe it was Mark Way did like a crowdfunder for, cause there became a lawsuit. Uh, they were arguing a, a tortious interference, 
Uh, and uh, so Mark Wade did like some kind of GoFundMe. I don't know what it was, but one of one of the people that backed his uh, his censorship effort. Uh, was Neil Gaiman, who's always been proclaimed to be anti-censorship. So oh, yeah. that was kind of that was kind of that was kind of revealing to me about the type of people that that are in the in the industry. Again, you know, I'm coming from blue collar. I'm, I'm not I'm not on the ins and outs of who the deep knowledge of who these people really are and how they're uh, how they really treat each other. So you know, I really found out that a lot of people in the comic book industry are pretty vile. Uh, and uh, when I saw Neil Gaiman do that, who I was never a fan of, but I, you know, I respected because again, I, I thought his ideas were anti-censorship, but the yeah. moment there, there's something being censored at, by the mainstream in a big effort, uh, against an indie publisher and, uh, indie creators, uh, Neil Gaiman is one of the first ones to sign up to watch and support their censorship. So fuck Neil Gaiman is, uh, <laughs> basically what I'm getting at. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a whole drama that went on for a, a good long while. Um, you know, Joe Casada had a three day Twitter battle with us. And I, again, that was kind of eye opening to me. I'm like, why is the, I think he was the CCO at Marvel at the time, the chief creative officer kind of, I, my understanding is kind of a liaison between the publisher and, you know, the Hollywood stuff going on at that time. You know, like, why would he climb down from, you know, that high of a ladder to get down into the gutters of publishing uh, but he did uh, apparently he was bored and or he may be an activist as well and uh you know so he went and had three-day twitter battle with me ethan richard uh it, you know it's just the entire thing was like it, it was like if if i wasn't living it i'd be like this none of this could have really been happening this is so silly um but it, it did happen it did happen i watched neil gaiman become a, a pro censorship piece of shit uh, you know, and, and jawbreakers. Even now, by the way, John, not to cut in again, but even now, even if you're like, you know what, I don't like Comics Gate. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Gaiman uh, was behind the illegalization of the Internet Archive, uh, which is basically a free library on yeah. the Internet for people who are poor uh, or just researchers, people who want to read books, can't afford to read books, people who just want to listen to a 100 year old jazz record. All of this stuff is stored on the Internet. Neil Gaiman was an activist who said, shut it down because we're not getting our royalties, right. uh, us authors. Yeah. Piece of shit. Absolute piece of shit. Any, hmm. Anybody who was in the arts uh, who supported the close down uh, and the illegalization of the Internet Archive, and by the way, it was ruled in their favor. It's going to be off the Internet soon. Should be absolutely disgusted by that. Regardless of how you feel about Comicsgate, that's who this guy is. Uh, terrible. Hmm. So now I'm in comic skate. Uh, you know, I mean, there's well, now you get uh, pushed to something. Now you get pushed. Yeah, so, like and, and said, I'm not that political. And you I'm not even. Me, I've never had a political conversation with you. So yeah, I'm not, not even. Sure, I'm not even sure if when I did that, if it was even being called comic skate. I, I think it was right around the same time that this word kind of started popping in. Uh, but again, I'm not the most plugged in on what what everybody's doing. You know, at any given moment. So, um, but yeah, so. We launched our book, uh, then Ethan launched his book uh, and did tremendously better than we did. I, we did 400,000, Ethan did over a million, I believe, on that first Five one. 538, John, I didn't do tremendously better. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay, all right, well, that's still 100 and some odd yeah, thousand dollars more. <laughs> Ethan's a million dollar man on these campaigns now, yeah. so he's, he's, he's incredible. But anyway, so once people saw that there was a uh, avenue, and, and just back up for a second. We had our goal uh, when we did that crowdfund. We did our goal at like uh, $8,000, I believe, Richard and I. So if if we hadn't made that money, <laughs> like everybody would have been, the winds would have been taken out of everybody's sails because they would have been like, this is not the way to go. This, don't, don't talk about your politics ever again because look what happened to the Jawbreakers guys. These guys didn't even make $8,000. If that would have happened, that would have been a huge blow to everything that's out there right now. Right. Um, thankfully, oh, and also originally, uh, Richard put the campaign on Kickstarter. Uh, that did not go through. That was that was like the first kind of cancellation. They, they, uh, and then we went to Indiegogo. So when people knew about that cancellation, and I don't even know how much they knew about that because Richard was kind of embarrassed by it at first. He's like, now was, you know, with Kickstarter, because I remember doesn't... that, you know, that with the big oh, Kickstarter yeah. thing back in the day, was that that it was not even, it, it, it was just not even accepted or it was accepted and then they took it down if somebody complained? Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I, Richard, 
uh, put it out there, and I, I think he had some kind of a mention of I, I don't know if it was like in a pre campaign because I, I don't think it ever launched, but so I think he, he had some mention it. about social justice in there or something like that. And they're like, nope. So no, um, it wasn't that they got complaint. First of all, there were activists again, the same people who were writing those articles about John who were supporting those people. Uh, supporting those media types, they mass flagged and reported Richard C. Meyer and John Malin's campaign. These guys are bigots and you don't want them on their platform, on your platform. And what happened was, uh, you know, you guys got a little letter. I got to refresh John's memory about it. See how we suppressed yeah. it all? You got a little letter <laughs> I've about moved, it. I've moved on. I've, 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 I've moved on and largely on everything. Just, I just it's this. infuriating. People yeah, should I, understand I, what happened. John was a big part of, of history, I believe. This is going to be, when it comes to the arts, this era is going to be looked back on with absolute disgust and fury, I think, by everybody. It, it's a disgusting period. But they sent a, a note. Kickstarter said, sorry, we're not going to publish this because it doesn't meet our community standards. And mm. Richard C. Meyer wrote back and said, it's it's some G.I. Joe guys uh, fighting a giant monkey. Like, there's no language in it. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it. Uh, please yeah. re review it again. They said, I'm sorry, our decision's final. No, we found out that it was the SJWs behind it. Richard decided he was going to keep that secret. Uh, and he came to me and he said, well, you know, what do we do? I'm just going to say that Indiegogo was a better platform. Andrea, my Andrea, was researching all of this stuff. We had decided to go to Indiegogo anyway because it was 5% as a better platform. Uh, but um, uh, Richard decided to go there too, and he held, he kept that secret because he felt, and I think rightly so, that if the SJWs knew they had that kind of power over us, while John and he were still like newborns at this, you know what I mean? They're still in the fucking nest. Uh, if they knew they could just crush us like that, they'd do the same thing at Indiegogo. And we'd never get anywhere. It would be so a mob was like, mentality like a riot. It would that's, just, it would just, they it would just immediately, riot. wherever we went, uh, it would be a problem. We would have no way of getting started. But uh, Richard told somebody uh, named Holly, remember HP? She made all these uh, fucking, what did, what did she do? She used to make little art collages, uh, HP collage or something like that. Okay. Told right. her. And she went and she told Richard Pace. She went and told like B. Clay Moore. Uh, and <laughs> it got out to the SJWs that they'd had a victory, but not until John and Richard were firmly cemented over on Indiegogo. And, and I, I want to show an image here again that just, yeah. you know, you want to talk about being under this kind of pressure. Uh, and uh, John was under tremendous pressure all the time. Okay. He's over already, this. I'm just fascinated by this because I, and I'm infuriated and fascinated at the same time. And I have so many questions to ask about it. And I'm just, I'm starting to get <laughs> this whole night's giving me Ajita. So let, let's, uh, yeah, let's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? But I, I want yeah. you to just be in awe for yeah, one minute here because. Yep. You got Kelsey Shannon here who says he uh, predated John, but he, Kelsey didn't go through shit, okay? It was all John Malin. Sorry, Kelsey. Uh, <laughs> under all this pressure, okay, and, and like desperately we needed to succeed, John Malin somehow, I don't know, you know, I sometimes when I'm drawing, I feel like I have God and angels on my shoulder. It, when I do something really good, I'm inspired. Somehow John produced this. See where my cursor is here? The image all the way to the right. This yeah. was... What people thought was the cover, it isn't. It's page one of the book. It's just page one. Uh, and lit the fucking internet on fire. I don't know how John did this, but this let everybody know that we were going to be just fine. And this was uh, an amazingly inspired, exciting piece of artwork about these new characters that launched the comic skate era. By John, how did you do this? Like, wh what were you feeling when you drew this? Uh, did you have any memories of this? Like, what was yeah, going uh, because uh, because when we were getting this together, and because of the importance of it all, I said, uh, whatever we put on this campaign, it it's got to be, it's got to be incredible. It's got to be, you know, a, a two hundred thousand dollar thing. Like, like I got to draw. Like, I want two hundred thousand dollars out of this campaign. Uh, so I, I spent a good amount of time on there. Also, shout out Incredible Colors by Brett Smith. Uh, so just so everyone knows, the, the image on the far left is Kelsey. The two on the right are mine. Uh, yeah, the the middle one is just a uh, further on interior page. So, so you, you had to. You were in the fight of your creative life here. Yeah. You, know, you had to draw your ass off to survive. Yep. And John didn't realize it, but he was drawing so that everybody that followed him would be able to survive. Ooh. See, I, it, yeah. it, you know, 
without John doing this image, none of this would have worked. Yeah. It wouldn't it's have worked you, at all. You, you, like I said about inspiring to become an outlaw, um, uh, is because you literally, you, literally, you galvanized a large segment of the comic buying public or former comic buying public who loved comics and felt that they were forgotten. They were left behind or they were uh, insulted daily in the pages of the comics uh, supposedly spoken by the heroes that they love for, for, you know, for years and years and with this new thing. And, and now they see something maybe in themselves too is with this. Yeah. This is the kind of comics I like. That's what I got. What people came to me again, mm -hmm. I didn't have to fight through any of this stuff. I've been, I've been part of this for four years, I think only. So, you know, yeah, the whole point of me backing up to this anyways was just to point out that there was nothing offensive about this book. There was no reason for it to be, there was nothing controversial in the material. Uh, there, there was no reason for anybody to ever, uh, Mark Wade, Neil Gaiman, to ever step in and feel like they needed to keep anyone safe from this material. Because it really is, it's a G.I. Joe fighting kaiju book. That That's Ooh. the entire thing. It, it's, I don't know, 20, 30, no, no, 48 pages, I think, so. Because uh, that's kind of where we are, you know, what, when we do a crowdfund, 48 pages. Sure, so, yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, there, there was nothing there that, that should have ever, and not that anything should really be tried to blown out. I mean, you really have to cross a lot of fucking lines, you know, before anybody should be like, you know, we don't want, we don't want pedo shit out there, you know. Well, but this, yeah. this is as vanilla as it comes. And uh, just because of politics, that's it. I and mean, that's kind of the You were discriminated thing. against. Just, just because uh, people want to support Trump or they want to be conservative in their views, that was enough reason for... Uh, the hounds of hell of Mark Wade to uh, come out here and censor uh, independent comic book creators. And, don't, you know, and, and that take that away. That should be the warning to everybody, you guys. If they don't like you, you could go through the exact same stuff we did. You know, so, you know, understand that these people are not going to be your friends. They're only going to be your friends as long as you're useful to them. That's it. Uh, so this could be you, this could be you in two years, five years, Neil Gaiman, uh, could be supporting another creator that's trying to cancel you, uh, for doing a completely vanilla comic book. Um, but you might've voted uh conservative. Right. And that's all the justification they need really. It'll so, happen to him too. It's, it's not just mm -hmm. that Neil Gaiman, see JK Rowling thought she was safe. She's way bigger than Neil Gaiman ever could ever dream of being. And she's been canceled. Uh, it's going to happen to Neil, too. It'll happen to everybody. They'll, eventually, they will find you because it's so fun to destroy people anonymously from the Internet. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for me. <laughs> John, I just I, I remember I like I have warm, happy memories of being in those chats of diversity in comics, those live streams and the one where he finally revealed this artwork. And if, I think he just showed a piece of it at first. I can't remember how it how that all worked, but. I just remember him saying this comic book that we're talking about by this artist that we all like, and he didn't say mm -hmm. it was you yet. And when he revealed this piece of artwork, the, the chat, and by the way, the chat was small. It might've been 300 people at the time. It was still comic skate was new. Mm -hmm. um, the chat just lit up with excitement. Uh, John Malin, I'm announcing John Malin is going to be drawing Jawbreakers Lost Souls. And it was the first book of the comic book era. Uh, era. And, and this right here is, um, this did it, man. This made it all possible. So, you know, that's why I love you, buddy. You like I, I wouldn't have made it without you. I, I saw this and went, oh, we can actually do this. I've been working for DC for so long. We can actually do this. Yeah. Yeah, and so now comics. Gate, and no, I didn't really think there was going to be a lot of follow up. You know, I, I didn't think that we were going to be like really kind of setting and opening, blowing open doors or anything like that. I, I thought what we were doing was, you know, really kind of just taking a stand and making a point. Um, but then, you know, it, it did open doors. I mean, it, it, you know, because of the success, and once we went past that eight thousand dollar mark, uh, we 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 were moving to a hundred thousand, then two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars over the period of that campaign. Uh, you know, it, it was incredible. And uh, through that through that success, and with Ethan coming up and doing a slam dunk right next to us, uh, I mean, that really created uh, Comics Gate in terms of the publishing end. That that solidified it, uh, solidified uh, creators coming over here and doing work. So uh, yeah, now now, now there's. I don't know, hundreds of campaigns that have come out now that yeah. uh, have been Comicscape. 
a lot of people and, and year after year we see these people the the ones that stick with it we've seen them grow you know uh, at first maybe they get 5000 10000 sure. 20000 30000 40000 um you know it, it's only gotten better you know for the people yeah. that are really committed and that as long as you have a uh, talented artist uh and if your writing is you know talented as well you should be able to grow here um and then you know obviously we encourage everybody to get up on youtube uh, build a platform and get talking to your customers, get talking to your audience, uh, you know, yeah. uh, bang some pots and pans, uh, make some noise and, and be entertaining. Uh, and hopefully uh, they'll come out there and support you when, when it comes time to put a book out there to the tune of, you know, 50,000, 100,000. Uh, my, my biggest campaign so far uh, uh, was probably Graveyard Shift 3 and or Godlike. So right around $250,000 range. For those campaigns and a lot of chats here john that that you kicked it off in your and dare i say and correct me if i'm wrong but desperation you had no plan b yeah i mean in terms of uh you know look i, I was going to finish graveyard shift one way or another uh i wanted to be sure that i got the volume two of that finished uh for mark you know for uh the co-creator so i mean that and then after jawbreakers that's what we did we launched graveyard shift volume one which was already drawn because right up till the time that I worked at Marvel, I had already finished the uh, volume one, but I wanted to be able to get volume two uh, done. I, I think that was uh, the bare minimum of what we needed for that story to work. Uh, so now we've we're, we've hired other artists to come in uh, and we've, we're at volume four. Volume five is about to start uh, production. Uh, so I've been working on uh, my my part of the uh, script for that. Uh, Mark you know, is obviously the writer, uh, but I work over uh, in the second draft for that stuff. Uh, so that's heading out right now. Actually, we, I brought an editor, Clayton Barton. So Excellent. that script is in his email right now. So he's going to really help guide uh, alongside me. Uh, so I'll be credited as editor in chief and then he'll be editor. Uh, so he's going to take some of that uh, weight and basically making sure pages are coming in on time. Uh, yeah. So now, that's going to be the, the bulk of it. So. Now, with Godlike, you know, uh, it's closed. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, are we going to we are going to see a Godlike second chance. We're going to have a second chance campaign. It's going to launch probably May or June. So the closer, you know, I, I, I'll solidify a date for that. I, what I want is I want to be sure my previous project, Omega Storm, uh, gets out there. Uh, that has, uh, you know, the uh, we're almost at color. Uh, we're almost work. We're working on colors right now. I think uh, Tommy, the artist, has maybe nine to twelve pages left to go on it. So we're so close to that. I'm just really trying to make sure we get that out. We get that one delivered as quickly as possible. And then right behind that, we'll be fulfilling uh, Godlike is the plan. I love this page, you son of a bitch. Look at this. Oh Thank my you. God, gorgeous. Love it. Yeah, I, I love the fans. I, they're all, I, like you said, the mainland militia, Ethan. I, I love all the people that I've met through you guys. Uh, I consider you both great friends. I have a lot of respect for you guys. Uh, personally, I've never heard um uh any any kind of anti-semitic uh any, anything like that that that's ever come out of you i find it repulsive um and i'm really really pissed off about the fact that you have these journalists um that that would just run with these articles and stuff or go after you or and not want to confront you as a true journalist should do and to say well i'm seeing this am i reading this right that never seemed to be the case they just they saw blood they saw something they wanted to be true and and then they just like you said they they created a brush fire and, and, and Billy, it wasn't that they wanted it to be true or they didn't mean they didn't confront us they were afraid that they, they deliberately set out to propagate lies in order to destroy people uh who uh shared beliefs that were went against their narrative their own belief system and get us out of the way they did that deliberately. They, they, you know, there. It wasn't like I hope uh, this is true. I, I wish this were. It was. We know this is a lie, and we're, yeah. we're doing it anyway. Jeez, yeah, it's, it's. It, they're disgusting, repulsive, disgusting, evil people. You know, you know. I have experienced that. I've experienced a lot of pushback, but I don't give a fuck because I'm Teen Sensation Billy Tucci. You know, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and, and like you guys, you guys standing out there like brick walls. And I remember Ethan when you were going through all this. I, you know, I wasn't really active in the Twitter or anything like that. You know, I kind of didn't have fucking time for it. Still don't have time for it, but now I'm learning. 
And uh, again, I'm fascinated by all this. It's yeah. Uh, you stood by me, Billy. You were just yeah, like uh, you would be seen with me uh, at conventions yeah. in the heart of all this, which yeah. a lot of people wouldn't. So I, I'll never forget that. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely, never, never. Uh, you lot. know, if anyone says any shit, I mean, we've had you know, Debbie's had conversations with other pros that just said stupid stuff. Just and it's the same stuff over and over again. And you know, Debbie too. You know, we love you guys. We do. Um, you know, we consider you guys family. And just the things that they would say with no no basis in fact, just like this running with the articles. And sharing and hate, spreading hate. Deb, Deb go after no. them. Deb would have conversations and how firm she is, little five foot three of her, you know, and, and shut them down. Like, oh well, I really don't have personally, I don't have a problem with Ethan, but well then shut the fuck up. Hmm. So John Malin, apparently people have a lot of problems with though. <laughs> Me too. No, John, I'm one of them. Well, that, that's what that that's what I wanted to add. I, I said back then it was very volatile. Like, it, mm -hmm. you know, to to even be associated with us was, you know, it, that was kind of dangerous to people's career. So, you know, for Billy to be out there, you know, that's incredible. Um, things are a little bit better now. Yeah, you know, I think uh, in, in terms of you know people coming over here again, the the growth, the money, the success, I, I think has uh, convinced people that oh, they're not so bad. So, uh, whatever the case may be, we've grown and, uh, you know, for, uh, being as despised as, and vilified, uh, as we've been through the mainstream comic book media, you know, they still haven't taken us down yet. So that's right. Uh, so we got to stay strong. We got to keep doing this stuff and, uh, keep being successful because they hate that above everything else uh, to see that we're not living in the street poor, um, and, right. uh, dying. So, because I really do think that 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 is ultimately what they'd like to see is uh, one of us die, uh, oh, I, and just yeah, I be agree. completely destroyed. So, uh, when we when we have people out there like that that new Joe Glass incident, uh, where he you know used to shit on us for caring about the customer and trying to run good business, and now he's on Twitter talking about how his business is in the ground. I do I do take satisfaction out of that. So, <laughs> well, that's good. But again. Uh, you know, and rightly so. I mean, and the thing is, as John said, look at these campaigns that grown. Look at Mandy Summers, how Mandy has grown from her first work, the Wizard campaign. Mm -hmm. Look at Charlie's London, right? Look at her with with that. Mm -hmm. I hope she submits that book. I hope she submitted that book to the Eisner Awards. Um, you know, look at look at Reenie, You know, kicking ass. Mm -hmm. I mean, just campaign blowing blowing old pros like Aaron Lepresti out of the water as much. No, as I didn't say all it. of our did. manly chagrin. We've got to, we've, the men have got to step up. <laughs> no, Everyone go back, Wraith of God by yeah, Wraith of God Aaron Lopez. Or, that's right, Lopez, a man called, or he'll come after you if you see his introduction on the Kings. But gentlemen, mm -hmm. love you guys. Um, thank you so much for this. Thank I, you, Billy. Appreciate it.